Hey guys, this video is going to be called um, Weeping and Gnashing of Teeth and Hellfire uh, because this is a subject I want to cover in uh, in this series. Um, I did do a video before called uh, What is the Gehenna mentioned in the Gospels? Uh, but I want to include it in this series as well because I'm going to expound on it uh, even more. So, um, The majority of Christians believe the notion of eternal hell where the fires are not quenched and the worm doesn't die, we unbelievers will be cast into after death and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's been a huge mess up in regards to the context of these verses and phrases in the Gospels. A belief has been massively forced upon the scriptures, uh, but when studied properly, a whole different picture will emerge. I believe in this traditional hell. Um, I did believe in this traditional hell for a few months until I started getting vivid dreams about it. I was being tormented. Um, something felt wrong. I took a step back to study the subject and pray to reveal the truth. Uh, the truth would be revealed to me and, you know, for the, the scriptures to make sense in some way regarding this subject. So, I know, after a month or two, I was quite shocked to see how easy it was to debunk. Um, the problem really lies in the, ba the Latin Vulgate language to English translation, where Anglo-Saxon words were applied rather than the original Hebrew and Greek names. This makes a massive difference to understanding the context that's being used. The first thing I noticed uh, was the origin of the word hell, which uh, doesn't exist in the original Greek or Hebrew, but the real word is that's used is uh, Gehenna. Um, yeah, I'll explain in this chapter what Gehenna is. So, uh, first, the origin of the word hell is an old English word, hell or hella. Um, it means the abode of the dead or um, um, from Proto-Germanic Helljo, I think that says, the underworld. Uh, basically, it's a it literally means uh, a concealed place um, to to cover or to conceal. That that's basically what the word means. The original word, it's a it's a German word. It is. The English word may be in part from Old Norse mythology, um, which means uh, to cover or hide something. In Norse mythology, the name of Loki's daughter who ruled over the evil dead, uh, the lowest of all worlds. It's a pagan concept, a word fit into a Christian idiom. So the idea of hell is a pagan and Nordic myth. Um but what's it doing in the Bible one might ask. But you know the word means to conceal or hide, um which would be suitable for the Greek word Hades, but not Gehenna. Both Gehenna and Hades are separate words in the Greek and mean two different things. Um, but for some reason, to the English translation has used hell for both words. Why is this? I propose that the translators wanted to force this pagan myth on the text and dis distort the gospel. Um, so yeah, basically, the word hell, if you look at the concordance, it's um, Gehenna and Hades. Two separate words mean two different things, both translated to hell for some reason. You know, why, why have they done this? Um, where did the word hell come from? Um, I found something online about this. It says, what's the opposite of these words? To torment and punish forever? How about to cover and conceal and to protect for a temporary period of time? Shockingly, perhaps for some, this latter phrase in the uh, etymology, the original meaning for our modern English word hell, moreover, comes from a pagan source, not from the Bible. Um, it also has little, if any, resemblance to our modern-day images of hell. Uh, the new Encyclopedia Britannia confirms its little-known uh, etymology this way: "Hell, the abode or state of being, of being of evil spirits or souls that damned to post-mortem punishment, derived from an Anglo-Saxon word meaning to conceal or to cover." Uh, Webster's, Webster's Dictionary explains that hell comes from Middle English old. Um, Old English and Old High German, Hell, Hella, or Hellam, that rose during the Anglo Saxon pagan period, AD 400 to 1100. Our word helmet is derived from the same uh, word root and meaning 
A helmet cover conceals and protects the head. It certainly does not torment or punish one's head. Similarly, the word hell or hella was used in Europe during the Middle Ages when potato farmers would hell their potatoes. That is, during the winter, they would cover, conceal and protect their uh, potatoes by digging holes, putting their potatoes in the ground and covering them with dirt. These farmers referred, uh, referred to this process as putting their potatoes in hell, again, for the purpose of care and protection, not to torment and punish. Um, the origin and basic meaning of the word hell has nothing to do with any other world will the afterlife place or place of eternal torment and punishment with no hope of escape. Um, you know, I could read the whole um, thing, but I was just picking stuff out from there. Yeah, basically, the word hell would be right for the word Hades because Hades is the, um, is the equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol. You know, the righteous unrighteousness and the souls of animal went to Sheol, which just meant the grave. You know, it was the grave covered them with dirt and it was a dark place. So Sheol just means grave. Same with Hades. Hades just means grave. And the word hell would fit that description if hell was used in its original meaning. Not the meaning we we put on the word hell today. When someone says hell, we automatically think of a place of eternal torment and punishment where, you know, devils are ripping people's genitals off and what whatever. But that that hell that word hell never meant that back in the day when it was being used. So um, this hell belief was present in the world before Jesus came along. So why didn't Jesus correct it? This belief originates uh, from Egypt and Babylon, where the Jews were held in captivity. They brought back pagan myths and worshipped pagan gods such as Molech. It didn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if these myths and belief began to spread throughout Israel and among the Jews. Uh, but what does the Old Testament say about heathen beliefs? Jeremiah 10.2 Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. The Jews were told not to learn the ways of the heathen. God took them out of Egypt, but they still had beliefs about God and the afterlife from the Egyptian myths. Uh, it would have been hard for them to see any other way. As I studied the Old Testament, I found no traces of this place called hell. Uh, it's taught that if you sin, you go to hell. Or if you don't accept Jesus, you also go to hell. But where is this place in the Old Testament? Surely if this place is bad as they say, and you are there for eternity, why doesn't God warn Adam and Eve before they sin and eat from the tree of knowledge. Um, the wages of sin is death. Um, being away from the presence of God is death. Adam and Eve died. They did not go to a spiritual place of fire and torture for eternity. Uh, when you read the Old Testament, you'll get an understanding of both the righteous and, and the unrighteous go to Sheol, which means grave. They waited conscious. Uh, they wait unconscious until the resurrection. Many people think Sheol is a dark place where the dead go, where they are in prison and conscious till the day of judgment. Um, but all those texts just mean the grave. So I found um, a description of Sheol. Old Testament, the Hebrew word Sheol refers to the grave or the abode of the dead. Uh, so again, that hell word does suit Sheol, but you know we've just twisted the meaning. Psalms 88.3, Psalms 88.5. Through much of the Old Testament period, it was believed that all went to one place, where whether human or animal. Psalms forty nine twelve, Psalms forty nine fourteen, Psalms forty nine twenty. Whether righteous or wicked, Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes nine verse two to three, no one could avoid Sheol. Uh, Psalms forty nine to nine and eighty nine verse forty eight, which was taught to be down in the lowest parts of the earth. Unlike this world, Sheol is devoid of love, hate, envy, work, thought, knowledge and wisdom. <clears throat> Again, read Ecclesiastes 9.6 and Ecclesiastes 9.10. Uh, descriptions are bleak. There is no light. Uh, Job 10.21-22, uh, Psalms 88.6, Psalms 88.12, uh, Psalms 143.3. No remembrance, no praise of God. In fact, no sound at all. Uh, his habits are weak. Uh, trembling in shades who can never hope to escape from his gates Sheol is like the ravenous beast that swallows the living without being sated some thought the dead were cut off from God while others believed God's presence reached even to Sheol Psalms 139 8 where David says whether I'm ascending to heaven you are there and when I make my bed in hell which is the grave you are there so basically David says that you know wherever he is if he's 
ascended or if he's down in the grave, God is there. So, yeah, Sheol, Sheol is the grave where everyone goes when they die. <clears throat> this is what the Old Testament teaches. Nowhere does it teach about this eternal place called hell. If anything, it's taught the New Testament. Um, if anything is taught in the New Testament that is not in the Old Testament, it's a false doctrine. Jesus and the apostles never taught anything other than the law and the prophets. You know, some people will claim, ah, oh, yeah, but uh, Jesus came to reveal the truth about hell. That's why it was never mentioned in the Old Testament. But Jesus and the apostles never preached anything other than the law and the prophets. Uh, if you read Acts 26, 22, uh, Paul says, um, I continue unto this day, witnessing, witnessing both small and great, saying, None other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So, if Paul never preached anything other than what Moses and the prophets said, where is all this confusion coming from? Because Paul never preached about hell in any of his epistles. Uh, if this was such an extreme place, why did Paul never preach this place to the Gentiles? Surely if anyone was going there, it would be the heathen nations and Gentiles outside of covenant with God. Um, all that has happened... All that has happened is confusion with the English words uh, compared to the original Greek and Hebrew. In this chapter, I will reveal the words to this proper context. So, so the word Sheol is the Hebrew equivalent to Hades, uh, which is Greek word for grave. Paul uses this word Hades in 1 Corinthians 15.55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So... If you were to use the word hell there, uh, instead of Hades, which happens a lot in the KJV Bible, it would read, O death, where is thy sting? O hell, where is thy victory? See, I don't think they wanted to put the word hell in because it would um, it would make people think that, um, you know, you could have victory over hell. It was a way out. That's why I didn't think they used the word hell. They, they used the proper word grave here, um, you know, which is funny to me. <laughs> but they didn't use that word grave in all the other instances where Hades was used. So, um, what does the word Hades mean? So, Hades just means the unseen world, according to the concordance. Um, Hades uh, means the unseen place, referring to the invisible realm which all the dead re uh, reside. Uh, that's from the concordance on Bible Hub. Right, so the word the word hellfire actually the original Greek word used in the manuscripts is Gehenna. It's not Sheol or Hades. It's Gehenna, which only occurs twelve times in the whole New Testament, and that's only in the Gospels. So, if Hades in the Greek means grave, then what about this place Jesus talks about, in which bodies will be thrown into the fire? They'll never be quenched, and the word uh, the worm doesn't die. Oh, cool, I've just noticed a typo there. So what about this place where all the weeping and gnashing of teeth? Christians are always quoting, Jesus talks more about hell than heaven, which is you know, just a total lie. Gehenna is only mentioned 12 times in the whole New Testament. Hades is only mentioned 10 times in the whole New Testament. That's not really a lot, is it? So Gehenna is the word uh, that is used by Jesus when talking about the fire people will be cast into in the judgment. So let's take a, a closer look at the context of this word and what it means to the original audience. So, what is Gehenna? Gehenna is a is the valley in the west and south of Jerusalem, also symbolic name for the final place of the punishment of the ungodly. So I'll talk about that later on. Gehenna, um, definition, the original name of a valley or cavity near Jerusalem, a place underneath the earth, a place for punishment evil. Um, but you know, this is the definition man has put on this. If you if you go to the concordance, it just says, you know, it's the transliteration of the Hebrew word term Gehinnom, the valley of Hinnom. Um, so, right, so Jesus only mentions this place 12 times in the whole four gospels. So, they are, the original audience must have known what this place was and what Jesus was saying. So, is it mentioned in the Old Testament? Well, the concept of eternal hell is not mentioned in the Old Testament, but what is mentioned 
is this place Gehenna, which in the Old Testament is not called Gehenna because the Old Testament is Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it's called Gehinnom, the Valley of Hinnom. So you could look that up in the Old Testament and see what this place is that Jesus is talking about. So Gehenna. Uh, from the Hebrew Gehinnom, um, our terms derive from a place a place outside ancient Jerusalem known as known in the Hebrew Bible as the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. Um, Gay Ben Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom is the modern name for the valley surrounding Jerusalem, um, Jerusalem's old city, including Mount Zion. From the west and south, it meets and merges the Kidron Valley, the other uh, principal valley around the city near the southeastern corner of the city. In the Hebrew Bible, Gehenna was initially where apostate Israelites and followers of various Baals and other Canaanite gods, including Molech, uh, sacrificed their children by fire their, thereafter was deemed to be cursed in Jewish uh, rabbinic literature the Christian and Islamic scripture Gehenna is the destination of the wicked uh, this is different from the more neutral Sheol and Hades the abode of the dead although the King James version of the Bible all usually translates both with Anglo-Saxon word hell uh, in the King James Bible um, the term appears uh, 12 times in 11 different verses as Valley of Hinnom, Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, and Valley of the Children of Hinnom. Um, so, yeah, if you go back into the Old Testament and find the verses that talk about the Valley of Hinnom, uh, what do you find? Right, so I did a bit of digging. Joshua 15.8. Then it ran up to the Valley of Ben Hinnom along the southern slope of... Uh, Jewish site city that is Jerusalem from there it climbed to the top of the hill west of the Hinnom Valley at the northern end of the valley of uh, Rephiam so here we have a scripture telling you um, where that place is uh, 2nd Kings 2310 um, he desecrated Topheth which was in the valley of Ben Hinnom so no one could use it to sacrifice the sons and daughters of the fight of Molech so here we are we have a scripture um, saying what it is uh, Jeremiah seven thirty one. they have built high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire God says something I did not command neither did enter my mind so Jeremiah seven thirty two. so beware the days of coming declares the Lord when people will no longer call it Topheth or the valley of Ben Hinnom but the valley of slaughter for they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no room. <clears throat> Jeremiah thirty two fifty five thirty five, sorry. They built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben Hinnom to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I never commanded, nor it did enter my mind, they should do such detestable thing to uh, so make Judah sin. So funny how God himself says the burning that burning sons and daughters in the fire is detestable and never entered his mind or heart. But millions and millions of Christians claim God sends anyone who rejects Jesus into eternal torture and fire, which makes people like Hitler look like a choir boy, to be honest. But what about babies or mentally um, retarded or, you know, people don't like that word, but mentally challenged people who can't accept Jesus? People who die who have never heard of Jesus, well, too bad, because they go into a never-ending literal fire which burns people alive for eternity. Um... But, you know, God says that's detestable. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. So so let's look at the 12 instances where Jesus uh, mentions Gehenna. Matthew 5.22 But I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger, in danger of judgment. Whoever shall say to his brother, uh, Raka, shall be in danger, in danger of counsel. But whoever says, thou fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna fire. So, is Jesus telling his crowd that if they call people fools, they'll be cast into eternal place of torture with agonizing fire? Well, I can I can vouch for most, literally 99% of humanity calling people fools. So, they're all going to hell, apparently. <clears throat> so, Matthew 5.29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into Gehenna. So how could a physical body be cast into a spiritual place? 
Jesus is obviously talking about the physical body organs in this verse. So how can he cast physical physical bodies into a spiritual fire? Just it just does not make sense. Jesus is talking about physical bodies, physical parts being thrown in a physical fire. So um the the rest of the verses Gehenna has mentioned is literally just um a rehashing of this verse, uh, especially in the Mark uh, Gospel. Uh, another interesting one, it's um, Matthew ten twenty eight. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So this is, this is where Christians say, ah, see, it's not just the body, but the soul, you know, goes to hell in the spiritual realm. But if you look at Genesis 2, 7, the soul is a living being. Um, when God when God breathes His Spirit into um, a body, it becomes a living soul. So the soul is is a part of that person. Its personality, will, emotions, whatever. Um, you know, the body and the the personality of that person will perish in in a fire. So um, Matthew twenty three fifteen. Okay. Um, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass the sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more a child of hell or Gehenna than yourselves. So the Pharisees were making um, proselytes, which were um, bringing in Gentiles and making them like themselves, basically. So it's clear that Jesus' threats were only to the Jews, and they were because they were under condemnation for killing the prophets and the blood slain upon the earth. If you continue in this chapter, Matthew 23, you'll see the context that's been used. The Pharisees were the only group of people in the Gospels Jesus opposed and condemned with Gehenna fire, and I'll explain later on. If you keep reading Matthew 23:33, You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of Gehenna? So he's talking about he's talking to the the Pharisees about, you know, how can you escape this judgment that's coming? Uh, this fire judgment because again the Pharisees um, who were a generation of vipers would be damned to Kehenna fire for the righteous blood spilled uh, from Abel to Zachariah the whole chapter must be kept in context especially the end the whole chapter is woes to the Pharisees for killing the prophets and you'll see this at the end of Matthew 23 um, it's all aimed at the Pharisees for killing the, uh, the saints and the prophets um, that judgment would come upon that generation, um, you know, all the righteous blood slain upon the earth and the prophets. So, just keep it in context, guys, who Jesus is talking to. Um, he's talking about their destruction and their judgment upon that generation he's speaking to um, for the reasons for killing the prophets and all the blood slain upon the earth. So, keep it in context, guys. Um, so... This Gehenna is only mentioned in 12 times uh, in the Gospels, which is Matthew 5.22, Matthew 5.29, Matthew 5.30, Matthew 10.28, Matthew 18.9, Matthew 23.15, Matthew 23.33. So most of them are in the book of Matthew. Then you have Mark 9.43, Mark 9.45, Mark 9.47. Again, those verses are just uh, Mark's account of what Jesus said in, in Matthew exactly the same then you have Luke 12 5 and James 3 6 so in the whole Bible this place of fire and torment is only mentioned 12 times and only in the gospel books this seems rather suspicious to me notice that this place is never mentioned in the Old Testament nor the epistles of Paul I find that very suspicious also my conclusion is that Jesus was warning the Pharisees about the coming judgment upon Jerusalem which would be a furnace of fire that would devour the adversaries. The whole city would be burnt down to the crown, including the temple, which was heavens and earth, which would end the law and the old covenant. Paul never told the Gentiles about Gehenna, because it was a place within Jerusalem, and they would have literally no clue what he was re referencing to. Um, it only held significance to the Jews, seeing that they used Gehenna as a place of sacrifice to Molech, and using it to burn their garbage 24 hours a day, a fire that was continuously burning and never quenched. So, this phrase, okay, um, where the fire would not be quenched and the wind would dieth not. So, where Jesus actually quoted an Old Testament verse here. 
So again, keep it in context. Read Isaiah sixty six twenty four. Um, it's about God's final judgment against the wicked, which was Jerusalem. And it shall be from new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind shall come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of men, so this is literal physical corpses of bodies, who has transgressed, transgressed against me, for their worm will die not, and their fire will not be quenched. And they will be in abhorrence to all mankind. So, if you read Isaiah 14.11, Your pomp and your music of harps have been brought down to Sheol, so down to the grave. So it's not talking about a spiritual being, it's talking about a man who will be brought down to the grave, um, a physical grave. Maggots are spread out of your bed beneath, and the worms are your covering. So it's talking about physical grave, physical dirt, physical worms covering your body. Isaiah 26.11 um, o oh Lord, your hand is lifted up, yet they do not see it. They see your zeal for the people who are put under shame. Indeed, fire will devour your enemies. So, in context, we can see Jesus was warning the Pharisees about coming fire upon Jerusalem that would destroy a third of them, and the rest to be taken into captivity. This fire would be it would destroy the wicked generation who committed adultery to God in their covenant, and become the whore of Babylon, and made the nations drink uh, from the cup of her fornication. Revelation 17 and 18 was written before 70 AD and predicted the fall of Jerusalem with fire which burned it to the ground and the whole world rejoiced. This damnation was only aimed at one group of people. In a certain place, uh, the Pharisees in Jerusalem, obviously this place Gehenna doesn't exist today. The fires were quenched and now it's a place where it's a nice place um, in Jerusalem where it's lush green gardens full of flowers, trees and wildlife. Some people would agree that Gehenna was indeed a garbage dump in Jerusalem, but then claim Jesus only used it, uh, this place, uh, to describe the spiritual hell that they'd go to after death. Uh, what's interesting, if you if you look at the word Gehenna on its own, the Greek word Gehenna, it, start, it starts off with Ge, or Ge, which is G-E, um, which in the Greek means land or earth. So, if you turn to the concordance and look up G-E, it means the earth land. <clears throat> uh, short definition the earth soil land definition the earth soil land region country inhabitants of a region so 1093 gi properly the physical earth uh, so yeah it, it basically in accordance it means uh, physical earth so Gehenna means a place on physical earth so um why do then people say this place is spiritual? Uh, this this view has been influenced by pagan myth of hell and Hades. You know, I could post pages upon pages of how this myth originated from pagan influences, but later on in this chapter I want to explain um, who this was aimed at and why. The question of weeping and wailing, um, you know, it's still on people's minds. You know, what about this weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and being cast into outer darkness? Well... Not being funny, but if there's a place of fire, then it's not a place of darkness. You know, fire lights up darkness. So, um, the only reason why people will think this place is a place of in the afterlife is because of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But when you understand uh, this parable, it will all make sense. Uh, please see my video, the the rich man and Lazarus parable. <clears throat> but I'm also going to expand on the rich man Lazarus parable to explain what um, you know being cast into outer darkness means. Um, if you read uh, Luke thirteen twenty eight and Matthew twenty one forty three, you you will see Jesus talking about the sons of the kingdom being cast out. So the sons already had the kingdom, which was the Jews. They already had the kingdom, being in Israel, they were cast out of the kingdom, and the kingdom were being given to another nation who produced the fruits. So, it was being given to the Gentiles. That's why they say, preach the gospel first to the Jews, then the Gentiles. Um, if you read Romans 11, Paul talks about Israel being blinded and being our enemies. Um, you know, the, uh, the gospel and the kingdom being given to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. So, it, it all connects together, guys. And uh, my next video is going to be called The Sons of the Kingdom Cast Out, where I'm going to make sense of all 
this this video and make sense of it so you know watch out for that one cheers guys